This video is sponsored by Chime. Hands down, one of the most impactful lessons I've learned in my life and continue to learn is that who you are now is a direct result of your habits that you had in the past. You are shaping your future right now with the habits that you practice every single day. And this is also true with your financial habits. In 2017, my husband and I sort of buckled down on our finances. We paid off $70,000 worth of debt and continued to let, live debt free. And in order to do that, we didn't just have to change some of our financial habits, but we had to keep those habits in check. And we had to allow those habits to sort of change and grow as we went through different seasons of life. But the good thing that I find with habits of all kind is that usually good habits lead to more good habits. On the other side, bad habits tend to compound into more bad habits. If you have a couple of bad financial habits that you are following right now, it can easily snowball into even more financial mistakes. So today I want to share with you some financial habits that you might have fallen into that could be a sieve on your finances and some little tips and tricks on how to change those into some good habits so that those good habits can compound. Okay, number one is over buying food. In the last year with general like food inflation, I feel like when our grocery budget just kept growing and growing and growing, we really had to sort of face the music and get strict about how much we were spending on our groceries. And I have an entire video on this down below, which I will link. But basically when we got really strict, we were obviously buying different kinds of food, but we were also buying less food. I think one of the most drastic things I noticed when we really buckled down on a grocery budget was how much less food was in my fridge. <laughs> and initially when you are used to having totally stocked fridge and you go to a fridge that maybe isn't always stocked, it feels a little worrisome. I feel like we all like have this like weird intrinsic scarcity thing when it comes to food. But what I actually found was it was also super, super freeing. I could always at a very quick glance see everything that was in my fridge. I was never digging to find things. I wasn't forgetting about something that was in the back of my fridge. Ultimately it ended up being really eye-opening because even though there was visually so much less in the fridge every single week, we still had plenty to eat every single week. I find that most of us tend to over buy food. When we are having a party, when we are hosting people, we always overestimate how much food we're always going to need. But what I really realized is that there was always still something to eat, even when my fridge wasn't fully stocked. And I got a lot better about buying just what we really needed and not buying surplus, which is a habit that I think so many of us have gotten used to. We have gotten really used to buying way more food than we need. And when you get a lot more conscious about that and you start to actually cut back, you'll see that you very often don't need nearly as much food as you were buying. All right, number two is over buying on non-essentials. Now, here's the thing. Marketing companies are really, really good at convincing you that you need products. A single scroll through Instagram can have you convinced that you need a special shampoo just for your hair, that you need some fancy new cookware set to be a better baker. You need some fancy smoothie powder so that you'll be healthier. And of course, you need the new it water bottle. They're really good at convincing you that you need these things. But when you learn to sort of step back and say, is it that I actually need this product? or is it that I am buying the expectation of what they are telling me this product will give me? And that's always one of my favorite ways to differentiate when I am making a purchase. You'll find that very often we're buying the expectation of something. Am I buying this personal shampoo because I actually need shampoo? Or am I buying it because the expectation is it's going to make my hair more beautiful? Am I buying the smoothie powder because I really need it to survive and to nourish my body? Or am I buying it because I expect that it's going to make me healthier and somebody who drinks smoothies and does yoga every single morning. When you get really good at differentiating want versus need, it makes it a lot easier to be smart about your purchases. And you can look at your monthly spending and start to really differentiate what things are on there are needs and what things are maybe just wants or things that you're, you have out of expectation of what they will give you. Number three is paying for convenience. And yes, I'm losing my voice a little. I was sick. I feel fine, but now my voice is going. Anyways, paying for convenience is something that I think a lot of us have gotten accustomed to. We are all super, super busy. And so we outsource a lot of things, right? We have somebody mow our lawn, somebody comes and cleans our house, somebody gets our groceries for us, somebody washes our dog. Literally, if there's something that you want to outsource, you can find a way to outsource it. Certainly outsourcing some things because we literally don't have the bandwidth for it is not a bad thing. But 
The problem is when it becomes a habit, when we just become so accustomed to outsourcing all tasks that we're not even taking a second to say, wait, can I just do this myself? Maybe this is something I actually can tackle. Really reconsider the things that you are paying simply for the convenience of them and take a second to step back and ask yourself, is it really worth the money I am paying for somebody else to do it? All right, I wanna take a second to thank the sponsor for today's video, which is Chime. Chime is something that could definitely help you out if you are looking to stay on track with your finances a little bit more. Chime is an award-winning financial app and debit card that millions of Americans use to manage, save, and spend their money. And the unique thing about Chime is they're designed with you in mind. Chime doesn't charge you membership fees, monthly fees, late fees, or low balance fees. Chime offers fee-free overdraft on up to $200 in debit card purchases and cash withdrawals with their spot me for eligible members. You can also get your paycheck up to two days earlier with direct deposit with Chime. Applying for a Chime online checking account is totally free. You can use the link in my description box down below to check it out today. Number four is not purging your social media feeds and your inboxes. It is estimated that two out of every three impulse purchases happen in bed on our phones, which means it is not the stores that are convincing us to buy things, it is something on our phones. It's our email boxes and it is our social media feeds. And that is because those places are constantly selling to us. You can be really diligent about avoiding this. Personally, once a month, I do a huge purge of my email. I go through, I unsubscribe to a bunch of stuff. How many emails do you get every single day? A lot. So you're really good at just deleting emails. By, by actually taking the extra step of unsubscribing, you'll make sure that none of those offers are coming into your inbox and sort of enticing you into those impulse purchases. And I do the same thing on social media. Certainly you can't turn off all of the ads that you have on social media, but you can be diligent about unfollowing accounts that maybe you find tend to make you feel like you need to buy something. Whether it's a store that you follow, they're constantly selling sales, maybe it's somebody you follow who shares a ton of affiliate links, whatever it is, whatever accounts it is that you find are often convincing you to buy, you can unfollow these people, you can mute these people or these accounts so that they're not showing up on your feed. Again, with inboxes, I think sometimes we just become accustomed to these accounts that are on our feed or these emails that are in our inbox and we forget that we actually do have some control over this. Next habit is impulse purchases. And impulse purchases is absolutely a habit. I know because I have ebbed and flowed in and out of these throughout my life as well. And just like I say good habits, breed good habits and bad habits, breed bad habits. I find that as I'm making impulse purchases, I make more and more and more of them. And as I cut them back, I make less and less and less of them. And that's how I know it's a habit, right? Because if I'm doing it more and more and more, this is a habit that is compounding. Now, impulse purchases are one of the hardest things to curb because they happen on impulse, right? You don't have a lot of time to necessarily like always think about it. There's actually a recent CNBC article that said that the average American is spending somewhere around $314 a month on impulse purchases alone. And that's up from $183 only two years ago. So obviously impulse purchase as a habit is something that is growing for so many people. So how do you decrease this? I think the best that you can do is just to be aware about what's triggering that habit. Know about your weak spots that cause you to make impulse purchases. Like I said before, a lot of impulse purchases are happening in our bed on our phone. So being aware of making purchases on our phone as being a culprit for impulse purchases. Something I do is I don't save any of my credit card information on my computer or on my phone. Yeah, it's really convenient to have it there, but that step of having to get up to get my credit card for every single purchase really helps me curb impulse spending. Because that act of standing up and walking to my wallet can be enough to sort of stop the habit, enough for me to say, wait, do I actually really need this? Another common culprit of impulse purchases is emotional, whether it's out of boredom or it's some type of retail therapy. But the problem is, Retail therapy, especially online retail therapy, has been proven not to work. Studies have proven that you get a rush of dopamine from the expectation of getting something, but not from the product actually arriving. You're getting that good feeling from browsing online, but once the product actually arrives, that good feeling is gone. A lot of us think that it's like this product, when it arrives, it's going to make me feel better, I'm gonna be so happy to have it. It's not, it's actually just the act of like checking out your cart that makes you feel good. And I think being aware of that and sort of catching yourself when you're thinking of buying something, and certainly one of the best tricks here is always the add to cart trick. I will add things to my cart, but I don't check out except once a week. So this way I can look at everything in my cart all in one week. Usually I see how much it adds up to, and I'm like, I don't really need all of this 
stuff or some time has elapsed and I've realized that I don't need it. But you can do this in a lot of ways, whether it's just that you have a rule that you wait till the next day to purchase something or whatever it is. All right, next up, you know that this is gonna be on the list because it's on every list and that is eating out. When we paid off our $70,000 worth of debt, one of the biggest things that we did right from the get-go was cut back how much we were eating out because at the time we probably ate out quite a bit. We definitely had at least one date night every single week. We probably had a dinner out with friends once a week. We probably got one or two lunches or breakfasts out a week and then maybe take out at least once a week. And it really, really adds up and it was a really obvious line item on our budget. But the problem is eating out is a habit. It is something that we automatically default to if we are in the habit of doing it. So it's not necessarily enough to just be aware that you're overspending on eating. You have to understand that you have developed a habit. When you are tired, when you are bored, when you feel burnt out, when you had a bad day, you are defaulting to take out or to going out. So the way that worked for us is we just developed a weekly cap that we had for eating out. You can either do it as like a number or as a price. So you can either say, you know, we get one takeout or eating out meal a week or two or whatever you decide works for you. Or you can set a price point, um, which is what we did. So say you say it's $50 or $100 or whatever, and that way you can split it up. Maybe you do a breakfast and a lunch. And what that does is it gives you something concrete to stick to. So you can't continue to make excuses. Oh, I had a bad day. Oh, I don't have the whatever I need to cook this meal. You have just that amount for that week and you can't go over. So you gotta get creative. And at first it feels hard, but what happens is when you do a week after week after week, you find that you've developed a habit of eating out a lot less. And just like good habits develop more good habits, you're gonna find that you default to that takeout a lot less. All right, my last habit, which I don't know if you can necessarily call a, a habit, but I think that it is, and that is not having financial goals. I think in order to stick to any financial plan or budget or whatever, you need to have a goal that you're actively working towards. Sometimes we just want to budget because we're overspending or we don't have enough money or whatever, but that's not going to be enough motivation when we're faced with switching the habit. Like we need the motivation to keep us going. I find absolutely the difference between success and failure with any of our finances has come down to whether or not we had a goal that really mattered to us that we were working on. Whatever it is, it needs to be a goal and it needs to be one that really matters to you because that's way when you are faced with the habits and you wanna to default to the bad one, that's usually the easier one, you're able to remember that goal and it's going to help keep you on track. And when you meet a goal, you need to make another goal to keep you going. All right guys, that does it for today's video. Thank you so much for stopping by and watching. As always, I hope you're having a fantastic day. Remember to be kind to yourself and others, and I will see you all in my next video.